and death in the vacuum of space, Arthur Dent and his new companions now face a missile attack and certain death. Far back in the mists of ancient time, in the great and glorious days of the former galactic empire, life was wild, rich, and on the whole tax-free. Mighty starships plied their way between exotic suns, seeking adventure and reward amongst the furthest reaches of galactic space. In those days, spirits, spirits were brave, the stakes were high, men were real men, women were real women, and small furry creatures from Alpha Centauri were real small furry creatures <laughs> from Alpha Centauri. And all dared to brave unknown terrors, to do mighty deeds, to boldly split infinitives that no man had split before, and thus was the empire forged. Many men, of course, became extremely rich, but this was perfectly natural and nothing to be ashamed of, because no one was really poor, at least no one worth speaking of. And for these extremely rich merchants, life eventually became rather dull, and it seemed that none of the worlds they settled on was entirely satisfactory. Either the climate wasn't quite right in the later part of the afternoon, or the day was half an hour too long, or the sea was just the wrong shade of pink. And thus were created the conditions for a staggering new form of industry, custom-made luxury planet building. <laughs> the home of this industry was the planet Magrathea, where vast hyperspatial engineering works were constructed to suck matter through white holes in space and form it into dream planets, lovingly made to meet the exacting standards of the galaxy's richest men. And so successful was this venture that very soon Magrathea itself became the richest planet of all time, and the rest of the galaxy was reduced to abject poverty. <laughs> and so the system broke down, the empire collapsed, and a long, <clears throat> sullen silence settled over the galaxy, disturbed only by the pen-scratchings of scholars as they labored into the night over smug little treatises on the value of a planned political economy. Magrathea itself disappeared, and its memory soon pa passed into the obscurity of legend, in these enlightened days, of course, no one believes a word of it. <laughs> Meanwhile, on Zaphod Beeblebrock's ship, deep in the darkness of the Horsehead Nebula. I'm sorry, I just don't believe a word of it. Listen to me, Ford. I found it, I swear I found it. Look, Magrathea is a myth, a fairy story. It's what parents tell their kids about at night if they want them to grow up to become economists. And it's we're currently <laughs> orbiting around it. Zaphod. I can't help what you may personally be in orbit around, but this Computer! Shit. Oh no. Hi there! This is Eddie, your ship or computer, and I'm feeling just great, guys! And I know I'm just gonna get a bundle of kicks out of any program you care about through. <laughs> is this necessary? Computer, tell us again what our current trajectory is. A real pleasure, fellow. We're currently in orbit on an altitude of 300 miles around the legendary planet of Magrathia. Go! <laughs> Proving nothing. I wouldn't trust that computer to speak my weight. I can do that for you, sure. <laughs> oh, thank you. I can even help you work out your personality problems from 10 decimal places to take a Zaphod, we should have John coming up any minute now on the planet, whatever it turns out to be. Okay, okay. Uh, let's just take a look at it. Computer. Hi there! What can I just do? Just shut up and give us external vision on the monitors. Dim the lights on the bridge. Electronic switching. <laughs> Why don't we play it up a bit of music? Pink Floyd. There. The dark mass you see on the screens, now the planet of Magrathea. Or whatever. I wonder if Columbus had this trouble. Who? Oh, sorry, just an esoteric Earth reference. He discovered a continent which went on to cause a bit of trouble. Arthur will tell you about... Ar Arthur? What, what? What? You've been very quiet, Arthur. Yes, I always find it very relaxing listening to other people arguing when I haven't a clue what they're talking about. <laughs> the view's a bit dull, isn't it? Presumably it becomes absolutely enchanting later on. We are now transversing the night side. The surface of the planet is 300 miles below us. In a moment, we should see there. This point should coincide with some sort of crescendo in the music. <laughs> the fires of dawn. The twin sons of Solon and Ramen. Or whatever. Solians and Ramen. Two ancient furnaces of light creeping over the black horizon. 
It's fantastic. You gotta admit that. It looks fantastic. Trisha, I feel I may be missing the point of something. Well, according to what Zaphod's told me, Magrathia is a legendary planet from way back, which no one seriously believes in. A bit like Atlantis, except the legends say that Magrathians used to manufacture planets. <sighs> is there any tea on this ship? <laughs> Arthur Dent basically assumed that he was the only native ape descended Earthman to ever escape from the planet Earth when it was unexpectedly demolished to make way for a new hyperspace bypass. Because his only companion, companion disconcertingly called Fort Prefect, had already revealed himself to be from a small planet somewhere in the vicinity of Betelgeuse, and not from Gildefort after all. So when, against all conceivable probability, they were suddenly rescued from a certain death in deep space by a stolen starship manned by two people, one of whom is Ford's semi-brother, the infam infamous Zapod Beeble Rocks, and the other of whom is Trisha Macmillan, a rather nicely ape descendant a person that Arthur Dent once met at the party in Islington. It could only be because the ship was powered by the new infinite improbability drive, which of course it was. Slowly and majestically, this mighty starship begins its long descent toward the surface of the ancient planet, which might or might not be Magrathia. Well, even supposing it is, it is, which it isn't, what do you want with it anyway? I mean, I take it you're not here for the sheer industrial archaeology of it all. What is it you're after? Well, it's partially the curiosity, partially its sense of adventure, but uh, mostly I think it's the fame and the money. Just a dead planet. The suspense is killing me. Stress and nervous tension are now serious problems in all parts of the galaxy. And it is in order that this situation should not be exacerbated in any way at all that the following facts will now be revealed in advance. The planet in question is, in fact, Magrathia. <laughs> the deadly nuclear missile attack shortly to be launched by an ancient automatic defense system will merely result in the bruising of somebody's upper arm, and the untimely creation and sudden demise of a bowl of petunias in an innocent sperm whale. <laughs> in order that some sense of mystery should still be preserved, no revelation will yet be made concerning whose upper arm had been bruised. <laughs> this fact may safely be made the subject of suspense, since it is of no significance whatsoever. <laughs> Arthur's next question about the planet is very complex and difficult, and Zaphod's answer is wrong in every important respect. <laughs> is it safe? Margaret Thea has been dead for five million years. Of course it's safe. Even the ghosts will have settled down and raised families by now. Fanfare. <laughs> Greetings to you. What's, What's that? that? Computer. Hi there. What is it? <laughs> oh, just a five million year old tape recording that's being broadcasted at us. This is a recorded announcement. As I'm afraid we're all out at the moment. The Commercial Council of Magrathia thanks you for your esteemed visit. A uh, voice of ancient Magrathia! Okay, okay. But regrets that the entire planet is temporarily closed for business. Thank you. If you would like to leave your name and a planet where you can be contacted, kindly speak when you hear the tone. Answering beep. Beep! They want to get rid of us. What do we do? It's just a recording. Keep going. Got that, computer? I got it! Rock of thrust. <laughs> Last time fail. We would like to assure you that as soon as our business is resumed, announcements will be made in all fashionable magazines and color supplements. When our clients will once again be able to select from all that's best in contemporary geography. Meanwhile, we thank our clients for their kind interest and would ask them to leave now. Well, I suppose we'd better get going then, hadn't we? <laughs> There's absolutely nothing to be worried about. Then why is everyone so tense? They're just interested. We keep going. Sound of descent continues. Actually, I suppose I'd better say something about this. The descent noise should really be one of those continuously descending sound baths, which never really gets anywhere, because the world's tones are imperceptibly dropping out at the bottom, so new ones are coming in imperceptibly at the top. Even less fanfare. It 
is most gratifying that your enthusiasm for our plan continues, unabated. And so we would like to assure you that the guided missiles currently converging with your ship are part of a special service we extend to all of our most enthusiastic clients. And the fully armed nuclear warheads are, of course, merely a courtesy detail. We look forward to your custom in future lives. Thank you. Listen. If that's their sales pitch, what must it be like in the complaints department? Hey, this is terrific! It means you must really be onto something to try to kill us. <laughs> terrific. You mean there is someone down there after all? No, the whole defense system must be automatic, but the question is why? But what are we going to do? Just keep cool. <laughs> is that all? No, we're also going to take the evasive action. Computer? What a basic action can we take? Uh, not of free guys. Or, <laughs> or something. There seems to be something jamming my guidance systems. Impact minus 30 seconds! Alarm bells and sirens go off. <laughs> Right, uh, look, we've got a man who control the ship. Can you fly her? No, can you? No. Fort? No. Fine, we'll do it together. I can't either. I guess that. <laughs> Computer, I want full man control now. You got it! Good luck, guys! Get back by this 25 seconds! Okay, Fort, full retro thrust and 10 degree starboard. Howling screech of protesting Grok attentions. This section should be as violently noisy as possible. <laughs> more or less at this point, that one of our heroes sustained a slight bruise to the upper arm. This should be emphasized because, as he has already been revealed, they escaped otherwise completely unharmed, <laughs> and the deadly nuclear missiles did not eventually hit the ship. Our hero safely is absolutely assured. Impact minus 15 second, guys! The rockets are still homing in! You can't shake them, we're going to die! <laughs> Shut that bloody computer up! Zaphod, can we stabilize at X00547 by splitting our flight path tangentially across the summit vector of 9GX78 with a 5 degree inertial correction? What? Yes, I expect so. Uh, just do it. And God forgive you if you're only bluffing. Here we go. Even more noise from the engines. <laughs> Going round Hyde Park Corner on the moped. What? It's another Earth reference. Tell me later. It's no good. The missiles are still swinging round after us and gaining fast. We are quite definitely going to die. And you're not. You have five <laughs> seconds. Why doesn't anyone turn on this improbability drive thing? Don't be silly. You can't do that. Why not? There's nothing to lose at this stage. Does anyone know why Arthur can't turn on the improbability drive? Impact minus one second. It's gonna be great knowing you guys. God bless you. I said, does anyone know? Tremendous <laughs> explosion. Whoa! Which fairly quickly transforms itself into a little dribble of fairly light film music. <laughs> and dies away. What the hell happened? Well, I was just saying there's this switch here and you see and... Where are we, Trillian? Exactly where we were, I think. Then what's happened to the missiles? Uh, well, according to the screen, they've just turned into a bowl of petunias and a very surprised looking whale. <laughs> and the probability factor of 8,767,128 to 1 against. <laughs> did, you, did you think of that, Earthman? Well, all I did was. That was very good thinking, you know that? You just saved our lives. Oh, it was nothing, really. Oh, was it? Ah, uh, we'll forget. <laughs> Okay, computer, take us to land. Well, I, I say it was nothing. I mean, obviously it was something. I was just trying to say it's not worth making too much of a fuss about. I mean, saving everybody's life and all this. 
<laughs> Another thing that no one made too much fuss about was the fact that, against all probability, a sperm whale had suddenly been called into existence some miles above the surface of an alien planet. And since this is not a naturally tenable position for a whale, this innocent creature had very little time to come to terms with its identity as well before it had to come to terms with suddenly not being a whale anymore. This is what it thought as it felt. Pop, as of whales suddenly coming into existence some miles above the surface of an alien planet. Increasing wind. Oh, what's happening? Uh, excuse me, who am I? Hello, why am I here? What is my purpose in life? What do I mean by who am I? Okay, okay, calm down, get a grip now. Oh, this is an interesting sensation. What is it? It's a sort of yawning, tingling sensation in my, my... Well, I suppose I'd better start finding names for things if I want to make any headway. Well, for the sake of what I shall call an argument, I shall call the world. So, let's call it my stomach. So, a yawning, tingling sensation in my stomach. Good, good. Ooh, it's getting quite strong, and hey, what about this whistling, roaring sound going past that I'm suddenly going to call my head? <laughs> That sounds good, yeah. Yeah, good solid ring to it. <laughs> and the whistling wrong sound that can be a wing. Is that a good name? <laughs> Perhaps I can find a better name for it later when I find out what it's for, because there certainly seems to be a hell of a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. What's this thing? This let's call it a tail. Yeah, tail. Hey, I can really thrash it about pretty good, can't I? <laughs> Wah! Wah! Hey! Doesn't seem to achieve much, but I'll probably find out what it's for later on. Now, have I built up any coherent picture of things yet? No. <laughs> oh, hey, this is really exciting! So much to find out about, so much to look forward to. I'm quite dizzy with anticipation. Or is it the wind? <laughs> yeah, hey, there really is a lot of that now, isn't there? And, wow! What's this thing suddenly coming towards me very fast? Very, very fast! So big and flat and wide, it needs a big, wide-sounding word, like, like, crown! That's it, crown! I wonder if it'll be friends with me. The sound of sperm whale hitting the ground at several hundred miles per hour. Splat. Oh. <laughs> Curiously enough, the only thing that went through the mind of the ball of petunias as it fell was, Oh no, not again. <laughs> Many people have speculated if we knew exactly why the ball of petunias had thought that, we would know a lot more about the nature of the universe than we do now. <laughs> Meanwhile, the starship has landed on the surface of Magathea, and Trillian is about to make one of the most important statements of her life. Its importance is not immediately recognized by her companions. Hey, my white mice have escaped. Nuts to your white mice. It is possible that Trillian's observation would have commanded greater attention had it been generally realized that human beings were only the third most intelligent life forms on the planet Earth, instead of, as was generally thought by most independent observers, the second. Okay, run atmospheric checks on the planet. Flurry of very fast computer voices ringing around the ship in wonderful stereo, really off most of the lists of incomprehensible numbers. A few recognizable words like atmosphere composition, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, atmospheric pressure, rotational anomalies, etc. Are we taking this robot? Don't feel you have to take any notice of please. Oh, Marvin, the paranoid android. Yeah, we'll take him. What are you supposed to do with a manically depressed robot? You think you've got problems? What are you supposed to do if you are a manically depressed robot? No, don't try and answer that. I'm 50,000 times more intelligent than you, and I don't even know the answer. It gives me a headache just trying to think down to your level. All the computer voices suddenly stuck together. Well, uh... What's the result? One, two, three. It's okay, but it smells a bit. Okay, everybody, let's go. Good afternoon, boys. What's that? Oh, that's the computer. I discovered it had emergency backup personality, which I thought might be marginally preferable. No, this is going to be your first day on a very strange planet, so I want you all wrapped up snug and warm and don't play around. I'm sorry, I, I think we'd, we'd be better off with the side rule. What? Right? Who said it? 
Will you open up the exit hatch, please, computer? Computer. I'm waiting. I can't wait all day if necessary. <laughs> Computer, <laughs> if you don't open that exit hatch this moment, I should go. I should go straight to your major data banks with a very large axe and give you a reprogram, and you'll never forget. <laughs> is that clear? As the patch opens, <laughs> plain sound of wind. Thank you. Let's go. It's all going to end in two. I know. <laughs> patch closes, leaving total silence. <laughs> wind. Pink Floyd, Shine on You, Crazy Diamond intro from the album Wish You Were Here. It's fantastic! It's a desolate hall, if you ask me! It's bloody cold! It all looks so stark and dreary! Well, I think it's absolutely fantastic! It's only just getting through to me! A whole alien world! Millions of light years from home! Pity is such a dump, though. Where's they for? Hey! Just along the ridge, you can see the, rem the <laughs> remains of the ancient city! What's it look like? Bit of a dump. Uh, come on over! Oh, watch out for all the bits of will me. They are all walking off and their voices fade with the music. Do you realize that robot can hum like Pink Floyd? What else can you do, Marvin? Rock and roll? As they fade into the distance, the Pink Floyd music changes abruptly into rock and roll music by the Fab Four. Love, love me do. You know I love you. I'll always be true. So please. Okay, I've uh, found a way in. In? In what? <laughs> Down to the interior of the planet. That's where we gotta go. Where no man has trod these five million years into the very depths of time itself. Theme music from 2001. One, two, three. Duh. Duh. Well, according to the legends of Magatheans, lived most of their lives underground. Why? Did the surface become too polluted or overpopulated? No, I just think they didn't like it very much. Zaphod, are you sure you know what you're doing? We've been attacked once already, you know. Look, I promise you, the life population of this planet is no plus the four of us. And two white mice. And two white mice, if you insist. Come on, let's go if we're going. Er, uh, hey, uh, Earthman. Arthur. Could you sort of keep the robot with you and guard the center of the passageway, okay? Guard? Guard from what? You just said there's no one here. Yeah, well, just for safety, okay? Who's yours or mine? Good lad, okay, here we go. <laughs> well, I hope you all have a really miserable time. Don't worry, they will. <laughs> this is really spooky. Any idea what these... Strange symbols on the wall are, Zephod. I think they're probably just strange symbols of some kind. <laughs> but all these galleries of <clears throat> derelict equipment just lying about. Does anyone know what happened to this place in the end? Why did the Magrathians die out? Something to do, I suppose. Wish I had two heads like yours, Zephod. I can have hours of fun banging them against the wall. <laughs> Shine the torch over here. Where, here? Well... We aren't the first beings to go down this corridor in five million years, then. <laughs> what do you mean? Look! Fresh mouse droppings! Oh, you're bloody mice. What's that light <laughs> down the corridor? It's just a torch reflection. This stuff must be worth millions, you know, even if we don't find any actual money. I'll be there. Trust me. Trust you? Say, Fod, my old mate. I'd trust you from about as far as I could comfortably take your appendix out. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely something happening down there. No! Listen! Sudden electronic zap. Zap! zap. Cries from Zappa, Ford, and Trillium. Ah! Ah! Slump of bodies. Unidentifiable sounds of movement around them. Fade. Fade up wind. 
The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a very unevenly edited book and contains many passages, which simply seem to its editors like a good idea at the time. <laughs> one of these supposedly relates to the experiences of one Viet Vujigig, a quiet young student at the University of Maxima Glan, who pursued a brilliant academic career studying ancient philosophy, transformational ethics, and a wave harmonic theory of historical perception. <laughs> and then, after a night of drinking pan-galactic gargle blasters with Zaffa and Beeblebrox, became increasingly obsessed with the problem of what had happened to all the bureaus he bought over the past few years. <laughs> there followed a long period of painstaking research, during which he visited all the major centers of bureau loss throughout the galaxy and eventually came up with a rather quaint little theory, which quite caught the public imagination at the time. Somewhere in the cosmos, he said, along with all the planets inhabited by humanoids, reptiloids, fishoids, walking treeoids, and superintelligent shades of the color blue, there was also a planet entirely given over to bureau life forms. And it was this planet that unattended bureaus would make their way, slipping quietly through wormholes in space, to a world where they knew they could enjoy a uniquely bureaued lifestyle, responding to highly bureau-oriented stimuli. In fact, leading to the bureau equivalent of the good life. And as theories go, this was all very fine and pleasant, until Beat Wujigig suddenly claimed to have found this planet and to have worked there for a while driving a limousine for a family of cheap green retractables. <laughs> Whereupon he was taken away, locked up, wrote a book, and was finally sent into tax exile, which is the usual fate reserved for those who are determined to make a fool of themselves in public. When one day an expedition was sent to the spatial coordinates that Vujigic had claimed for this planet, they discovered only a small asteroid inhabited by a solitary old man who claimed repeatedly that nothing was true, though he was later discovered to be lying. <laughs> there did, however, remain the question of both the mysterious 60,000 Altarian dollars paid yearly into his Brantusvogan bank account, and of course, Zephod Beeblebrock's highly profitable second-hand bureau business. Meanwhile, on the surface of Magrathea, two suns have just set. Night's falling. Look, robot, the stars are coming out. I know. Wretched, isn't it? <laughs> but that sunset! I've never seen anything like it in my wildest dreams. The two suns. It was like the mountains of, bo of fire boiling into space. I've seen it. It's rubbish. <laughs> we only haven't had the one sun at home. I came from a planet called Earth, you know. I know. You keep going on about it. It sounds awful. Ah, no. It was a beautiful place. Did it have oceans? Oh, yes. Great, wide, rolling, blue oceans. Can't bear oceans. <laughs> Tell me. Do you get along well with other robots? Hate them. Where are you going? I think I'll just take a short walk. Don't blame you. Good evening. Ah! Who? Who? You chose a cold night to visit our dead planet. Who? Who are you? My name is not important. <laughs> I, uh, you startled me. Uh, do not be alarmed. I do not harm you. But you shot at us! There were missiles! <laughs> Merely an automatic system. Ancient computers ranged in the long caves deep in the bowels of the planet tick away the dark millennia, and the ages hang heavy on their dusty data banks. <laughs> um, I think they take the occasional pot shot to relieve the monotony. I'm a great fan of science, you know. Really? Oh, uh, yes. Uh. Um, you seem ill at ease. Yes, no disrespect, but I gather you're all dead. Ah, uh, dead? No, but we have slept. Slept? Uh, yes, through the economic recession. What? Well, five million years ago, the galactic economy collapsed. And seeing that custom-built planets are something of a luxury commodity, you see, you know we built planets, do you? Yeah, well, yes, I sort of got it. Fascinating trade. Doing the coastlines was always my favorite. Used to have endless fun doing all the little fiddly bits and fjords. So anyway, the recession came, so we decided to sleep through it. We just 
programmed the computers to revive us when it was all over. They were index linked to the galactic stock market prices, you see, so that we'd be revived when everybody else had rebuilt the economy enough to be able to afford our rather expensive services again. Good God! That's a rather unpleasant way to behave, isn't it? Is it? A, I'm sorry, I'm a bit out of touch. Is this robot yours? No, I'm mine. <laughs> if you call it a robot, it's more of a sort of electronic sulking machine. <laughs> Bring it. What? Uh, you must come with me. Great things are afoot. You must come now or you'll be late. Late? Late for what? Uh, what is your name, human? Dent. Arthur Dent. Late, as in the late Dent Arthur Dent. <laughs> it's, it's sort of a threat, you see. I've never been very good at them myself, but I'm told they can be terribly effective. <laughs> All right. Where do we go? Uh, in my air car. We are going deep into the bowels of the planet, where even now our race is being revived from its five million year slumber. Maglathia awakes. Air, car, air car shoots forward. <laughs> oh, by the way, we also had the sound of them getting into the car beforehand, but... <laughs> Excuse me, what, what is your name, by the way? My name is... My name is Slaughterbarfast. <laughs> I, I beg your pardon? Slaughterbarfast. Slaughterbarfast. I said it wasn't important. <laughs> it is an important and popular fact that things are not always what they seem. For instance, on the planet Earth, Man had always assumed that he was more intelligent than dolphins, because he had achieved so much. The wheel, New York, wars, and so on. Just all the dolphins had ever done was muck about in the water having a good time. But conversely, the dolphins believed themselves to be more intelligent than man, for precisely the same reasons. <laughs> Curiously enough, the dolphins had long known of the impending demolition of Earth, and had made many attempts to alert mankind to the danger. But most of their communications were misinterpreted, as amusing attempts to punch footballs or whistle for tidbits. So they eventually gave up and left the Earth by their own means shortly before the Vogons arrived. The last ever dolphin message was misinterpreted as a surprisingly sophisticated attempt to do a double backward somersault through a hoop whilst whistling the Star Spangled Banner. But in fact, the message was this. So long and thanks for all the fish. In fact, there was only one species on the planet more intelligent than dolphins, and they spent a lot of their time in behavioral research laboratories, running round inside wheels and conducting frighteningly elegant and subtle experiments on man. <laughs> the fact that man once again completely misinterpreted this relationship was entirely according to these creatures' plans. Arthur Dent's current favorite fact is that life is full of surprises. The theory from Legatius Requiem. <laughs> Come of the air car to flight through underground passages. It slows down. Earthman, we are now deep in the heart of Magrathea. I should warn you that the chamber we are about to pass into does not literally exist within our planet. It is simply the gateway into a vast tract of hyperspace. It may disturb you. Uh, oh. It scares the willies out of me. <laughs> Hold tight. Acceleration of air car. <laughs> Hatchway opening. <laughs> Sharp increase in music volume as if the sound is coming from inside the chamber. <laughs> the car shoots into an unimaginably vast cavernous space. <laughs> ah! Welcome to our factory floor. Ah, the light! <clears throat> this is where we make most of our plants, you see. Just. Does this mean you're starting it all up again now? <laughs> no, no. For heaven's sake, the galaxy isn't nearly rich enough to support us yet. No, we've been awakened to perform just one extraordinary commission. It may interest you. There, in the distance, in front of us. Oh, no. You see? The Earth? Well, the Earth will mark two, in fact. <coughs> it seems that the first one was demolished five minutes too early, and the most vital experiment was destroyed. There's been a terrible hoo-ha, and so we're going to make a copy from our original blueprints. You... are you saying that you originally made the Earth? Oh, yes. Uh, um, did you ever go to a place, uh, I think it's called 
No way. What? <laughs> no, no, I, I didn't. Uh, pity. That was one of mine. Won an award for that, you know. Uh, lovely, crinkly edges. <laughs> I can't take this. Did, did I just hear you say the earth was destroyed five minutes too early? Shocking cock up. <coughs> the mice were furious. <laughs> mice? Yes, uh, the whole thing was an experiment, you see. A ten million year research program to find the ultimate question. <clears throat> Big jump, you know. Look, would it save you all this bother if I just came up and went mad now? <laughs> As Slotty Barfast flipped his lid, are Ford, Zephard, and Trillian dying in fearful agony, or have they simply slipped out for a quick meal somewhere? Will Arthur Dent feel better with a good hot drink inside him? Find out in next week's ins exciting installment of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'd probably be able to cope better if I hadn't bruised my arm. Zephyr Beetlebox <laughs> is now appearing in No Sex Please, We're Amoeboids and Got Eularians at the Francis Vogan Starhouse. <laughs>